Welcome to the official tennis.com podcast featuring professional coach and community leader, Kamal Murray. Welcome to the tennis.com podcast. I am your host, Kamal Murray, and we are here with somebody that's actually very special to me, somebody I now call a friend. But when I got my first USTA membership and it came with the free tennis magazine, he was probably had the most read column in tennis magazine. And I remember looking at him as a tennis icon and insider. Uh, and over the years, we've gotten to know each other, you know, start coaching on the pro tour and, you know, we get an email here and there, hey, tough loss or you gotta turn things around. If anybody can do it, you can do it. You think about the friendships that I've been able to make on tour. And this is one that I cherish almost uh, one of the most. His name is Peter Bodo and he is uh, former writer of Tennis Magazine, ESPN, uh, now writing for Tennis.com. He is probably the most well-known uh, tennis writer in tennis. Uh, so, Peter, thank you for taking the time. Very kind words, man, but now you're putting the pressure on him. I'm going <laughs> to joke here. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you're my guest this week because when I think of the holy grail of our sport, it is certainly Wimbledon. It is the slam of all slams, although definitely the least amount of fans, definitely um, the hardest to get tickets to, the least amount of prize money, <laughs> but, but definitely holds the most prestige. Um, and when I think about that, and I think about you being inside in the sport, I was like, this, this is the week we got to talk about Peter, talk to Peter. Thank you for That's coming. Nice. Yeah. So. That. I got to start with, you know, one, we got some sad news. Annette Contevi is a fierce competitor, beautiful spirit. Uh, she just announced uh, that her career is basically over because of uh, a back injury where she will never be able to train. And it, to me, it, as a coach, it signals one important thing, and that is the window in professional sports is short. The window in pro tennis is very short. When you get hot, you got to keep going. Even if you played your 12 or 16 tournaments, you got to keep going because she was hot at one point. Uh, and you got to maximize that because you never know what happens. And I think this is a, a good example of a great player, a great person who was hot. I mean, I mean, she, she beat Sloan and I in Asia one time. I was like, man, this girl can, she can mm -hmm. play, right? Um, and, um, you know, it's sad to see her go at such a young age. You got a long life ahead of her. But, you know, I mean, geez, uh, it's just testament. You might want to send this podcast to Nick Curios, by the way, given I know, what, right? what you're talking here, you know. And, uh, yeah, you know, she and she's one of those interesting players who who, who really, you know, she did all her did all the, the the hard yards. You know, she worked in the trenches. She you know, physically, you know, fit. She came close she, as, you know, you know, what she did in, in Asia there. And, you know, she, she's come within a sniff of the really big win, the breakthrough win, getting herself established in the top. So it's really kind of heartbreaking to see somebody go out before they want to go out. Yeah. And conversely, you got Venus Williams, who accepted the wild card of the women, who has had the longest of long careers in tennis. What is your take on Venus still out there hanging around and playing? I mean, for us, it's still a treat. She'll definitely still be a draw. Um, but she is moonlight now. I love people who love to play. So basically, the fact that she's the, the last thing she needs is money. Although you know, there's always more to be had. Yeah. But you know, the, the, she she's just putting it out there. You can tell that you know that she's she's made to do this kind of. And I think it's really been also. I think for her as age goes on, she's kind of really realizing that she's had a lot of other diverse interests and 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 businesses and stuff. But I think she's probably realized that to some degree, even though her dad, Richard, was absolutely right about diversifying yourself and having other interests, that, man, you know, it's pretty hard to displace that tennis. And the idea of not having that in your life is, is really, really pretty challenging. On the other hand, she's really adjusted, I think, very well to playing with house money, which a lot of champions have not done in the past. And so basically, you know, she's she, she, she's not embarrassed out there. You know, people always say, well, you know, I don't want to be walking out there when I'm 35 years old and really, you know, I can't, you know, I can't hit the ball the way I used to. No, she said, yeah, I'm a player. I go out there and I play and I can always think I can win. I got that much self-confidence, that much, that much desire. And I think it's a, I think it's a marvelous thing. 
Well, let me ask you this though, because an another way to think about it is perhaps you are handing young players and people who may not deserve it, a piece of your legacy. If you stay on tour longer and, you know, obviously you're not at hundred percent, not at the level you once were, and you're handing people who were probably five years old, a very career memorable kind of win over you. And I think about that when I think about like Nadal or Federer, when they weren't hundred percent, they rarely, I mean, when I say hundred percent, I mean like able to compete, right? No one's ever hundred percent, but able to kind of compete and give it a good solid go. They just would not play. Right. I don't think that they could really stomach handing a piece of their legacy to somebody that just was uninjured at the time. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, so what do you think about that mindset? Oh, I, th I, th I think that's pretty interesting. I think it's actually very true. I mean, look, I mean, look at you look at how many of these guys use a big win, even even if there's an asterisk at the win because the other guy had an injury here. They look at Taylor Fritz and and um, and Nadal, you know, uh, couple years ago there they you know I mean it, it really is such a boost for some of these young players now granted Fritz is an established top professional already but I think he he kind of went to the next level after that Indian Wells uh, performance so I mean I think that's really really helped him I think I think it's great for young players to be exposed to that to, it's also great to see the you know the the fact that there are people who are in it for the longevity because there are a lot of other people whispering about you know how much they hate the game or you know get in there grab as much money as you can keep going and then get out quick and there's all kinds of stuff flying around there so to have people who are vested like Venus and to have them and and Roger for instance another good example of somebody he he didn't really overstay his welcome but I think I very well could have seen him doing that if if he didn't have the injury issues because he's another guy he just loves to play. And yeah. there's no shame in going out there and playing. And I think, uh, you know, Billie Jean King once pretty famously said that, uh, you know, people were saying, gee, Billie, you know, did, don't you think these people need to go out on top? Isn't that great? And, she, you know, she said, no. She said, your career should have a bell-shaped curve, basically. And you start, you struggle, you go up, you get good, you get really good. You walk away at the top, you don't know what the other side of the hill looks like. And it's, it's life valuable <laughs> to know what the other side of the hill looks like. So I have to ask, um, you know, when you think about our sport, right? And you think about just the memories, I mean, this the Federer and Nadal match, the uh, Isner Mahout match, right? You think about just some of the classic battle. And I can watch, I remember watching Curios play on court three. Um, and I was in the players lounge looking from above, right? I can remember seeing Sharapova lose. Um, maybe it was, um, the girl that had that long, long I remember, oh, you know what? I remember her losing to, um, I mean, a real pretty Russian girl. Uh, I forget her name, but anyway, on court three. And I think about all these sort of classic moments. Give me an example of one of your most memorable Wimbledons. Well, I mean, clearly the Isner Mahout match was just, it, you know, it was just insane. It was, it was kind of out of this world. So, I mean, that was, uh, that's, that's, that's a memory bank one that is just unbelievable. And, um, you know, one of the, one of the, my, on the women's side, one of my greatest memories, really, one, one of the memories I, I really hold on to for some reason, and I'm really not good at remembering stuff. People ask me two days after the final who won, and I have trouble f remembering who won the match, even though I watched it and wrote about it. It's just a weird thing. But anyway, um, it was, uh, and so this match is interesting, it sticks with me, but it was Venus and Lindsay. It was still, I think, Maybe the best women's final I've ever seen. Uh, the two of them, uh, Wimbledon, a long three-setter, both of them really hitting the ball beautifully. It was a wonderful match. And uh, I don't even think it was on center. It might, might have been on court one. Mm -hmm. uh, but, man, it was it was wonderful tennis. I kind of remember that. And, of course, going back, you mentioned the um, the player lounge and looking down at the courts going, you know, back in the day, the graveyard court number two was down there. Uh -huh. And so I remember seeing Connors get beaten by, I guess it was Tom Gullickson, I believe. Uh, and then I saw McEnroe lose a match there. And uh, so that's that's a good memory. That's I take that with me. I mean, that's a tricky course, especially on the far side, right? Because, you know, as a player, you're always aware of who, who's watching. So you oh, have yeah. fans in the court. And if you're on the far side and you look up and you see all the players and their coaches leaning over, you're like, damn, I can't lose this match, right? You know, you, you, it's yeah. super easy. To, and you're close to the street. So yep. it's really easy to get distracted and to start uh, thinking and managing too many sort of perceptions. You see the vultures up there. You look no, up and you see the right. vultures like they're sitting on a wire up there, like on a telephone wire. <laughs> and your next opponent is, is praying for you. Right? You know what I mean? You're sitting like, yeah, I hope this guy loses, right? 
<laughs> so, so what? Who is your favorite, and who is your dark horse, uh, both on the men's and women's side? Well, on the men's side, I kind of have. Obviously, it's, you know, it's impossible to. You know, I mean, it, it's tempting to go against Djokovic because if you happen to be right, he breaks a leg or something, and your guy wins. You look like a genius. But you know, the thing is, it's 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 very hard with his record at Wimbledon and the kind of momentum he's got after the French Open. It's very very hard to build against him. Having said that, though, I think there are definitely people who there who can who can more people who can beat him now than ever before. And I think partly, I don't think you're going to beat Djokovic with defense. I don't think you're going to beat Djokovic with baseline play. I don't think you're going to beat Djokovic with touch. I think what you're going to beat him with is raw naked power and the ability to push him around, preferably win a lot of free points. So, I mean, I think, and there are a lot of guys who can do that now. I mean, you look at these guys like like Sinner and, and um, um, not, not, not Rude, but the other uh, Scandinavian boy. I mean, it's just, you know, a lot of, you know, guy, Hatchetoff, I guess, is out, but there are other guys who can really, you know, hit the ball really big. And I think that might make a difference. One of those guys would probably be my dark horse if it's, if it's fair to call Francis Tiafo a dark horse. I don't know. Do you think does he fall into the dark horse category? Or has he moved up into contender category? It's a good question. No, no, no. I, I think Francis at this point in his career is uh, we we can't mix popularity with being a favorite. Right. And I think his popularity has significantly grown, doing a great job of crossing over in terms of relationships with other sports and the NBA and that kind of thing. But I don't think he's a favorite for a major yet. So I do think he's still a dark horse. Uh, in the dark horse category, I don't know that he would be my dark horse on Wimbledon, right? Um, yeah. You know what I mean? I think, I think to your point, this surface is one where I think Novak returns the weakest, right? Because the ball's going to move a little quicker. If you had a big server and someone serves really well, I think this is the one slam where he could get challenged. Uh, not saying he will. Um, so, you know, obviously, Djokovic, you can't, you know, you, you would be a fool to go against him. Um, but I also think that when you look at center, you know, because he grew up in Italy and playing on clay, you would think that that would be his favorite surface. I think the way he plays is more suited for grass. And I see him having a better tournament than Alcaraz. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, and, you know, I, I totally buy into that, but that's that's exactly what I'm talking about with these guys who can really whack the ball flat, you know, put Djokovic under a lot of pressure, move forward, prevent him from turning his defense into offense. And while those guys maybe can do it. Um, on the women, you know, Francis, what the thing about Francis is I think he, he's, he's had a pretty good history at Wimbledon. Yeah. And there's something like intrinsically funky about his game that I think really suits the grass courts, you know, the, the little hitch in the forehand and stuff. And he gets smacked in the ball and he can, you know, do a lot of stuff. But mainly I think also he's American. So I'm going to go with an American dark horse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's talk about that for a minute because as a writer, you have historically been seen as American biased. Even though you're not American born, right? You're Aussie, uh, Aussie born. But you, you were sort of, people view you as very, bias towards Americans. Where does that come from? That comes from actually, uh, actually I'm from Austria, actually, Austria. to Hungary, Hungarian parents. Um, but uh, it, interesting that you remember, and I appreciate that. Um, you know, the bias comes from actually being very thankful for, for what this country really has, has done for me. I don't want to get, you know, too deep on this or anything, but for my family and, you know, the fact that we were able to create new lives here and stuff. And I know it's a tough time for the country in lots of different ways. But I also feel, you know, there's nothing wrong with rooting, rooting for, your, for, your, for your fellow countrymen. Yeah, it's an international game. I wouldn't go out there, and if I were a fan, I'd like to think I wouldn't go out there and, you know, and, and, and hassle Nadal or Djokovic or anyone because they were, you know, quote, foreigners or anything. But, you know, I, I have an affection for, for, the, home, for the home team. I can't, I can't help that. I try not to let it influence me. As someone once said, you can't really be objective, but you have to try to be fair. Right. So, you know, I, I, I try to balance it and, and, and be, be fair with it. But, yeah, that's, that's my bias. So on the women's side, what are you thinking? Who's your favorite? Who's your dark horse? I think the women's side is absolutely, you know, wide open. I mean, I, you know, uh, Schmattek hasn't really had the confidence, I think, at Wimbledon and hasn't really, you know, cracked the code for grass court tennis. So, you know, right off the bat, that's a for Rebecca Keena, I mean, I, you know, the question is, is she going to be able to handle the pressure? That's one. Uh, 
Well, I let me say it. this. What I thought yeah. was most interesting, and it's funny, you know, as a coach, you always say, oh, man, I've got to defend this. I've got to defend that. She's going to come. She's going to be defending this. You're keeping track of those 1,000 points that you're going to lose, right? Or 2,000 points, right? So it was interesting in, like, a presser just a couple of days ago, I heard her say, I'm not 100%, but I'll do my best. And I was like, is that an attempt to take the pressure off? Or is that, it was that an attempt to, to do a trial balloon for an excuse, right? And, and I think that when I see people defend their first major, which this is her first time defending a major, you see that, right? I'm not 100%, uh, not feeling that great, but I'm gonna try to do my best. And then perhaps giving themselves the opportunity to work their way into the tournament. But from the other side, you also are giving that first or second round opponent a little bit more belief than they probably had. Because as a coach, I'm going to say, she's not 100%, keep her out here, right? What do you take from pre-tournament pressers where players start sort of, I don't want to say making the excuses, but also trying to relieve the pressure? I think it's great. I mean, it's a great study. And, you know, it's, it's a great opportunity for anyone to play armchair psychologist. And you can really, you know, and I, th I think you can read a lot into that stuff to players who are kind of edgy or touchy and they're a little bit, you know, short tempered, maybe they seem irritable. Uh, they're a little kind of clam up, they freeze up a little bit. You look at the, it's interesting also to look at the body language, like in depressors, you know, the people who hunch over and cross their arms self protectively, you know, they're, they, you know, they're not really that comfortable, not so much in, in the experience, but but really with the content of the thing. I mean, you know, uh, we saw with Naomi, of course, you know, uh, how that impacted her. So, you know, I, I think, you know, you, you get, you can read a lot into it there. And I think a lot, there are, I think, mind games being played all the time in tennis. Mm -hmm. The great thing for me is that the mind games don't always have the like, desired result. You put a lot of, you invest a lot into mind games and I don't think the payoff, generally speaking, is as big as one might expect or hope for when they engage in that kind of thing. So I don't know. I mean, I mean, I don't see any reason not to pick her as a favorite. She's been playing. I don't know about this injury, but she's been playing really, really well. And uh, I don't really have a lot of faith in Sabalenka. You know, I I don't think the spots on a leopard change overnight the way they seem to have with her this past year. And God bless her if she's playing great, fine. She, she, certainly she's playing great, she'll probably win the thing. I mean, there's just too much power there. But uh, I don't have a lot of faith. And I think she would be particularly susceptible to early round pressure. So the one thing I think her Sabalenka on this, not, she's probably going to have a solid tournament. But I think the one where I think she's a little vulnerable on the surface is her back swings are really high. Like her take backs are really high on a surface that gives you the lowest bounce. Mm -hmm. So I do think on this surface, I wouldn't pick her as my favorite simply because of the difference between the height, the, the height of the bounce and the height of her take back, right? And I think she'll have a solid tournament. She'll catch up to a few of those balls, but I think under pressure, she's going to be so late, right? If someone gives a, if someone gives the ball a little bit of gas with that sort of height difference, uh, then I think, you know, Rybakina is a better hard-hitting favorite than a Sabalenka. Uh, yeah, I'm with yeah, I think yeah. if I had to throw one more in there, I think Sui Attack. I think um, she would be my favorite because she plays the fastest. And on this surface, she has the opportunity to hit the quickest. Right? So if you think about the thing that makes her so hard to play, it is the speed. You always feel like she's giving 100% every point. You always mm -hmm. feel like she's coming at you from the very first point. But she doesn't really hit the ball that big. She hits the ball kind of quick, right? Not hard and heavy, but kind of quick. And I think if you take her, the speed at which she plays and combine with a quicker ball on grass, that would be the person I think is the biggest layup for a woman in champion. Yeah, I think I think it's true, and you know, this especially and the thing with the, the first week is always going to be interesting for these people because the courts haven't really hardened up yet, and everyone talks about how the courts have started to play more like cement courts and and hard courts, but that's not really true early in the tournament. First couple rounds, especially, so some weather dependency there, uh, you know, it's, it still is a very different game, as you say, and that low slow sliding I mean, you guys like dustin brown and people like that doing doing like really good work on this stuff in, in the early rounds so that's an interesting one i tell you who i don't know if you would call her an underdog 
But if, I mean, she's a two-time champion, but boy, Kivitova has not been doing very much for quite a long time. But she won this past weekend, and boy, I mean, I, I like that game on, on the grass. It's just a matter of there, too, whether she can stay focused and, uh, and deal with her nerves. Yeah, I, I would pick her. I would put her in my dark horse category. I don't think at this stage in her career anybody calls her a favorite. But when you look at, like, I thought during the, uh, the Sunshine Double, Indian Wells in Miami, she was playing great. Like, mm-hmm. I was looking at her as somebody that was going to have a big year. And then lastly, she looked amazing. You know what I mean? So she would be somebody that I would probably put in my top five sort of opportunities to win. Obviously, the draw has not come out yet. So, you know, that all, that, that changes everything. But I would say Kavitova would be somebody that could – certainly win this. I mean, you think about the two slams, the only two slams she's won, right? It, they have been on grass. So this is the place she feels like home. And that, that, I agree with that. That's a good one. I tell you, you know, you know who else um, is Mukova. I think Mukova has got a terrific game for grass. Um, don't you? She does have a terrific game for grass. She can do it all. Um, I'm curious as to how she handles uh, hangover from having such a good French open. Um, you know what I mean? I think if people get to their first slam final, you know, it could kind of like, it could kind of give them a little bit of shock. Like, oh my mm-hmm. God, everyone's, everyone's paying attention to me. Everyone's talking to me for the last month. Everyone has congratulated me. I probably got one or two new deals. And I think it, it rocks your world to a sure. point that makes it hard to refocus. Uh, so I don't know if she's quite over the hangover and ready <laughs> to win again. I first noticed her actually at Wimbledon one, a couple of years ago. And I said, "Wow, this, this woman's game, you know, really made for the grass." And uh, you know, even even then, it was already that obviously the altered surfaces, the harder harder underfooting. But she's uh, she's a lot of nice work at the net. Oh yeah, I, I remember I, the first time I ever saw her was at Wimbledon in like 2017. We were walking on the practice courts down the hill, uh, kind of by where the gym is, like the temporary gym, <laughs> and we like to had to walk past her court to get to the court adjacent to her. And she gave us this look like, how dare you walk past my court? And <laughs> really? the player I went was like, who is she? Really interesting. Like the look she gave us as if like she owned that oh, set no of four courts sort of to the far bottom. I was like, whoa. I mean, it was, it was some bravado. Um, but, uh-huh. uh, but yeah, she, she's a tough player, totally complete game. I don't know that I, I don't know that I would trust it. Knowing how, a big win like that goes and mm-hmm. how few of them can keep it going without sort of a hangover effect. I don't know that I trust her right now to do well. Interesting. Um, so you've written for everyone uh, over the years and you've had to watch, you, you've had the opportunity to watch different eras. Tell me about how the Pete Andre era differs from the Federer, Novak, and Rafa era? Well, I think I think if you added up the total number of Grand Slam titles won by those guys <laughs> and somehow converted that statistically, in, in a weird way, you do have a very, very clear and honest evaluation because, you know, the game's only gotten better. So you can't say that these guys, this big three now, uh, you can't say that they actually benefited from a, a weak field. You can't say they benefited from, you know, uh, being surface specialists because now it's almost like the game is becoming a one surface game, right? I mean, everything is kind of medium fat, you know, medium slow to medium fast. Right. And so, uh, you know, I, I don't, I don't know that there's any comparison. I mean, I think one of the things that really changed and it really hurt the early guys, the earlier guys, was the fact that Australia it just wasn't that important to them. So they would either miss it, sometimes not even play that well down. It was only in the Sampras era did it start getting good. And that's what I think that was the main reason. I mean, no offense. And I think Pete, Pete is terrific. And I think he's the next best player after these guys. But I, also, I think is one of the reasons Pete was able to, to break Emerson's record was because all these other guys, Connors and Borg and those guys didn't play down there. McEnroe didn't play down there a bunch of times. So I think, you know, I think that really benefited Pete. But I mean, boy, I think the evidence is that this is, I mean, it, this is more than a, the greatest era in tennis. It's, it's really unusually, you know, exponentially better than, you know, like the next generation, next generation kind of thing. Well, let me ask this question in because <clears throat> the five names I mentioned are sort of the definition of 
professionalism, consistency, mm -hmm. right? Longevity. Remove the remove Federer, Novak, and Rafa, and you look at from a character standpoint the next wave of players. You having watched so much tennis and seen, and and really been one of the guys that has been had the opportunity to interview all these guys, one of the trusted people to do these interviews. Who do you think has the opportunity to be the next big three? Not just because they can hit a ball, but from a leadership character and willingness to be professional and consistent and not get too distracted standpoint. Who do you think is the next three? Well, Alcaraz, I think, has clearly got all of the all the earmarks that you look for in somebody. He loves it. He loves playing the game. He's not, you know, he handles pressure pretty well. He he handles frustration really well. I mean, look, you know, going out the way he did to Djokovic, I mean, that's, you know, that was kind of a disaster, really, when you come right down to it. That's a lot of people would be embarrassed about that. It would be really, really furiously angry. He handled that like a champ, I thought, you know, I mean, um, so, I mean, he's clearly in the lead there. And for this whole podcast, I've been trying to remember the name of the uh, the uh, Danish kid. Holderoon. There you go. I, I just I, I beat you to it, please. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, I'm thinking, who, what? Why, why am I blanking on him? Holderoon. I think he's another one. They're the character. It's not even so much the game. I can almost look past the game, but they're the character. The guy's pugnacious. He can be kind of nasty. That's he's kind of on that Macro O'Connor's kind of a model when you look back back at, at tennis history and stuff. And he's got big game. He's got big modern game. So I think he's. You know, he's right up in there, uh, you know, and I wouldn't write Rudolph as a um, as a contender because he's very, very smooth, very consistent. There's a sort of obviously there's some issues there with the lack of power and second serve, I guess, and stuff. But he's, he's not a terrible server. I mean, he's not he's not awful. I don't think so. Um, I think he and, and Sinner, you have to put it in there, too. Those those four guys, I think if I, I may be overlooking someone here, but uh, you have any ideas I might be overlooking? Um, She's funny. She cheapos is up there, but yeah, I, I think Zverev at one point could have. I don't know that I still feel that way. Um, um, so no, that it really it's up in the air. I mean, you know, you would love to see Nick Kyrgios kind of like just take off. I mean, of the if you remove the big three, of mm -hmm. everybody else, he's head and shoulders the one that could just take this game to a whole nother level and like, you know, no one else is even close. Um, you know, maybe Alcaraz obviously is close, but um, everybody else would be, you know, non-existent if he, you know, had that had that sort of consistency to him. But yeah, no, I think um, I think you hit him. He'd have to win a little bit is a problem, right? Huh? <laughs> He'd have to win a little bit is the problem. You yeah, gotta yeah, win. You gotta, yeah. So, you know, one of the things I think is interesting about the sport is that a lot of times as players and coaches, you travel 38 weeks a year. And I don't know that we sit back a lot and think that the umpires are also traveling 38 weeks a year. The writers are also traveling 38 weeks a year and appreciate the entire circus, right? Oh, you just say, hey, it's a traveling circus. We're gonna see each other in Wuhan, then Beijing, then I'll talk about it, right? We're all kind of in this thing together versus separate. And I think a lot of times we've, or for a long time, we've viewed the media, the writers as something separate and less of a sacrifice. And I think you're an example of someone that's made that same sacrifice. What do you think we have to do to sort of have the players use the media to help grow the sport to the level that is football, American baseball, basketball, et cetera? Because I think the tug of war between the writers, the media, the players, um, or it could be even lack of appreciation could be one way to say it, right? It, it sort of held our sport back where there's not enough exposure, not enough access, not enough honesty, and not enough promotion. Yeah, it's interesting you say that because, you know, I've been, I, I think about this stuff too. And one of the sad things about being in the media is that the media is much more not designed to, but it's much more set up much more to be able to tear people down than to say build up a sport because everybody wants the story. And that's what, you know, that's why when people get 
you know, really angry about being asked certain things and it comes up a bunch of times in the Ukraine, Russian situation and stuff, exactly. you know, and then even the fans get into it and say, you should leave her alone, don't ask her questions like that, et cetera, et cetera. And the fact of the matter is, that's a story and nobody can deny that this, right in front of their eyes. This is this is a story. This is something. This is the important thing about this person, this match, this particular time. So and, you know, so a lot of times the players get very defensive about that. And then you you have this tension between the players and the press. It's really unhealthy for everyone, I think. And then you and, and you have models of people who have handled this really, really well. Serena later in her career really turned a corner and was able to handle it really, really well, I think. And Federer was like the master. Federer was like, and with Federer, you could ask him, you could, you know, you could ask him the, uh, you still beat your wife question, you know, wow. and, and he would say, no, I've never beaten her. And it's not probably, I wouldn't put it that way. And anyway, let's move on. Or, or you say no comment. And it's a little bit like you want to, you know, sort of grab people and shake them to players and say, look, all you got to say is no comment, or you really don't want to talk about that, or this is a very private matter to me. But it doesn't really happen, and there's all kinds of defensiveness going back and forth, and I think I think that's a shame. I think, um, you know, the, you know, the other thing is the media is also always going to be a little bit wary of being too promotional of the game. I'm a little different because I've been mainly a tennis writer most of my life, and other things I did had nothing to do with tennis. So it's I always consider myself kind of a, like the homer. You know, I would be, I was a pipeline through which people, through which players, you know, express themselves to the fan that I tried to put them in context and it gave them a voice. I tried to give them the voice and a platform, but you know, a lot of other things, daily coverage and stuff, that's not really the, uh, the mandate. So it's, it's a tough issue. Yeah. I always felt that, um, you know, we, we were missing internally, we were missing the opportunity to grow by not, you know, like sort of engaging more, being more open. Like the Netflix thing the WTA ATP has now is helpful. Mm -hmm. um, I think we've always been so closed. I can remember, you know, 2018 US Open. Um, I was talking to somebody, talking to a reporter, right? And they said, yeah, you know, no one's repeated. No one's defended the US Open title other than Serena. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm going to ask Sloan what, what she thinks her chances are. And I remember saying, please don't ask her that. Because it should be like, <laughs> which I thought it was great until you said that, right? You know what I mean? So it, it was kind of like, then I started to go to pressers. So I could hear what questions were being asked, what insecurities were being sort of brought up or uncovered. So then I could then address them at dinner in the car and try to put the player in and rebuild the player from a potentially sort of, and not a negative interaction, but like, a, oh, wow, I didn't know no one's just, has to <laughs> it's impossible to right? You know what I mean? Yeah, uh, absolutely. But I, I remember that, and I remember that sort of being, you know, I don't, I didn't go to the presser, so I hope the question didn't get asked. Um, but I remember saying, like, please don't ask that question. And I felt like my relationship with the media at the time helped. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. Look, no, I'm telling you. I mean, people look at you as one of the really good guys who, who are, you know, who are you know, open, communicative, you know, helpful, uh, straightforward, honest. I mean, those are all, you know, really, really things that, you know, more coaches actually should have. Uh, I think the problem a little bit also is that, you know, players don't have any voices other than their own. So, you know, they don't really trust, they don't like to people talking to their coaches, like, you know, Maria Sharapova, for instance, whoever she was working with at any given time, whatever, you know, no, you know, coaches would say, no, I'm, I'm not talking. When they say, when a coach says, I'm not talking, you know that means a player said you're not talking. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of how it works, I think. So yeah. I, I, that, that's a difficult, you know, that's a difficult thing. And I think that's there are a lot of opportunities missed missed with that. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and look, I mean, I, I know as well as anyone in my profession, some of the people can, can really be jerks. You know, they can ask the wrong question at the wrong time. They can ask a loaded question. They've got, I don't know, something in their heads either about the you know, lead they want to write or some track they want to pursue. And they will actually ask something that's really, you know, ranges from insulting to offensive. And there's better ways to do it. Every, every one of those questions that make people grit their teeth and make fans, you know, take to Twitter and, and, and dump on a guy. Every one of those questions can be rephrased in a way that is not nearly as offensive or insulting, really blunt it a little bit and you can still get the truth. I've always believed you can still get the truth by being, for lack of a better word, nice. Mm. 
So you've been very generous with your time, but I got to know one question. You have had a lot of access to some of the greats that number one, some writers don't get, and number two, some players and coaches don't get, right? Um, not anymore. It's a funny, funny you mention that. Not anymore. It used to be a little bit different. It's very difficult now, even for the best writers. Yeah. So tell me about one of your most memorable interviews. Oh, geez, that's that's a tough one. <laughs> uh, you know, there's so many. I think when I, uh, one that really pops to mind was when I went to Hawaii for Davis Cup match and did, did a, a long thing with McEnroe uh, about uh, he, he had just gotten together with Tatum, Tatum O'Neill uh, and uh, he was kind of, uh, I think they just had their kid too. I'm pretty sure this was that particular time. And, uh, you know, we just had, had, had a really good time. You get him away from the typical tennis environment, especially from a grand slam. And in that sense, Davis Cup, I don't know how Fed Cup has been, but Davis Cup has always been a great place for, for a reporter to, to get access and to have access and to do a good job with a, kind of a longer profile type story because, you know, there's there's not that much stress as you have at a Grand Slam and you're also not impinging on somebody's off time where, you know, you got to go, you know, I'd go and visit somebody for three days and, and you know, and talk and everything. And, and it also is, is a demand on a player. I mean, it's, it's definitely a transactional relationship, which is kind of tough because you kind of want to be friendly and you want to look at the person as kind of a friend and they probably want to see you that way too. But there's always kind of a transaction there. I've done some, I'm just trying to remember some. Oh, Martina Navratilova, the year, the big, the big blackout, uh, Northeastern blackout, rolling blackout, took out the entire East Coast, maybe even Chicago. I'm not even sure. It was giant. Gosh, I wish I could remember what year it was, but it was like 20 years ago, 25 years ago or something. <laughs> so Martina and I, so we, we agree to talk and we get in the car and leave and we can't get from the stadium to the hotel. So I'm there with her for like four hours sitting in the car. My interview's long finished. And I'm, you know, we're talking <laughs> about horses and about this and about that. Get back to the hotel. And uh, we had to, uh, they finally got a service elevator going, but we walked in the lobby and literally everybody's sitting at these tables and there were candles, you know, by candlelight because it was a total blackout. Um, eventually they got something going again and it was a service elevator that took, that did end up taking people. But that was, that was amazing. I'm just, in a car with Martina for four hours, you know? Right. <laughs> right place at the right time, right? Yeah, boy, was it ever. I, got a, I could have written a book, jumped out of the car and written a book. You know? Right, right. Well, Peter, you are one of the good guys. Um, you know, your career is long and storied. Um, you're probably saving some of these secrets for your next book. So I won't even ask you for any more. Uh, <laughs> I, wanted to, I wanted to thank you for your insight into pre-Wimbledon. Uh, your picks, your insight, uh, and also your contribution to the game. I know it's, you know, we've, we're all working to try to grow this game, make it more attractive and make it more lucrative, right, for everybody. Uh, and what you do definitely helps. So I want to thank you for coming on the show uh, and for all that you do. And right back at you. I think you're doing a great job with this podcast. Thank you. This has been the Tennis.com podcast with Peter Bodo. Thanks for listening.